Hi, welcome to A Word on Westerns. Things are a little bit different. I have nobody to interview today. Although fortunately for all of us, I have a backlog of unedited interviews that we'll be putting up in future weeks for A Word on Westerns. But today, today because they say laughter is the best medicine, I believe that, we're going to talk about the best comedy westerns. I hope you get a laugh from this and I hope you have some suggestions. I'm going to try to limit this to only 10 films. It's going to be very hard because there's a lot of funny westerns out there, maybe more than you think. So sit back, grab some popcorn. If you're like me, you'll put on your Fanner 50s and sit back and rollick as we ride west with Grin and Barrett Cowboy Movies. For our list of the top 10 comedy westerns, the funniest westerns ever made, gathered unofficially from filmmakers, historians, and fans, we will limit the titles to the talkie era. Coming in at number 10 is Texas Across the River from 1966. Dean Martin, at the top of his popularity, starred in this very, very funny spoof. Dean loved watching westerns, and he loved making them. Don't you The name's Sam Hollis, man. He had previously shown his mettle as a solid dramatic actor in Rio Bravo and proved once again that Jerry Lewis may not have been the funniest part of the great Martin and Lewis comedy team. You can see the joy he and the terrific cast had while making this film. And war Indians always yell, why? Why not? Joey Bishop's Indian sidekick role of Kronk is much funnier than it sounds. Rosemary Forsyth is lovely as the cultured heroine set to marry Alain Delon, the French superstar, in his American film debut. Delon, after an illegal affair of honor, must flee to Texas across the river, chased by a cavalry led by an unintelligible and very funny Peter Graves, aided by Andy Prime. TV's Cochise, Michael Ansara, even shows his comedy chops as Comanche Chief Iron Jacket. To help create the illusion of a true Western film, this movie looks great, too. Plus, the stunts from second unit director Buzz Henry are plentiful and well executed. Gun empty. Yell, bang, bang. For Comanche, need bullets, not jokes. Helped by a crew loaded with industry icons like Richard Farnsworth, Henry Wills, Joe Canut, Royd and Clark, and the great rodeo champion Casey Tibbs. Lots of loving cliches are given their due, and some unexpected bits of business still make me laugh. Number nine is 1939's classic Destry Rides Again, starring James Stewart as soft-spoken Destry, who comes to the lawless western town of Bottleneck, secretly looking for a killer. Marlena Dietrich is Frenchy, the good bad girl who runs the saloon for evil Brian Donlevy. Character actor Charles Winninger is winning as a drunk made sheriff as a joke by Donlevy. Winninger sends for Stuart, the son of a legendary lawman. Stuart becomes Winninger's slow-talking, non-gun-toting deputy, not at all the help he was expecting. Clichés? Sure. There's not only a wild saloon brawl, but a scratching, clawing girl fight between Dietrich and Una Merkel that ends with the two lovelies getting doused with a bucket of water. It's also fun watching the romance grow between Stuart and Dietrich. They made sparks fly both on screen and off. Dietrich's sexy saloon hostess can be seen as an early progenitor of Madeleine Kahn's Lily von Stuck in Blazing Saddles. No, Tom, you can't go out there. They know all about the federal judge. They kill you if you go down to the jail. They hear Tom. 
Director George Marshall scored so well with this version that he remade it 15 years later in Technicolor as Destry starring Audie Murphy. Destry Rides Again was Stewart's first Western and was a bona fide smash. He wouldn't strap on his guns again until 1950's Broken Arrow and Winchester 73, the film that launched a tougher, vengeful Stewart in a series of Anthony Mann-directed classics. Stan and Ollie go way out west for the oldest film on our list. Number eight in our tabulation for the funniest Western comedies is Laurel and Hardy's 1937 feature film classic, Way Out West. Wait a minute, last spit on me hands. All right. Oh! Oh! Hops a daisy. In their only Western, the boys are sent on a quest to find and deliver a gold mine deed to their late partner's daughter. After a series of misadventures with a mule, the boys arrive looking for the daughter in the frontier town of Brushwood Gulch. Jimmy Finlayson, the boy's foil in numerous films, is nefarious saloon owner Mickey Finn, who happens to be the young girl's guardian. Finn's mistress, Lola, pretends to be the daughter, and the boys innocently hand her the deed. When they discover their mistake, slapstick mayhem ensues with unforgettable set pieces, like the laughing scene with Stan trying to retrieve the deed while being tickled by the bogus daughter. The boys hiding inside a piano. And Ollie's head trapped in the floorboards being twisted and stretched by Stan before snapping back under the floor. Perhaps the most memorable scene in the movie is not comedic, but musical. The boys perform a wonderful soft shoe dance and also sing a charming rendition of Trail of the Lonesome Pine. Trio Westerns were back momentarily in 1986. Not the Rough Riders, not the Three Musketeers, not even the Range Busters. But those fictional silent movie heroes, the Three Amigos, went south of the border in John Landis' Western spoof, The Three Amigos. They were the biggest stars of their day. In 1975, that version of the song became a top pure comedy gold. Came in the casting of Steve Martin as Lucky Day. I'm Chevy Chase as Dusty Bottoms, and then newcomer Martin Short as Ned Nedlander. The trio of -of out-of-work actors is mistakenly hired to rid a small Mexican village from oppression, kind of like the Magnificent Seven, but with a few more laughs. A lot more laughs, actually. The Amigos think they've been hired to put on a show, and they do put on a show. Upon arriving, they perform a specialty number, My Little Buttercup, in a cantina to a perplexed audience who join in. It's a side-splitting set piece, one of many throughout the film. Luckily for our heroes, this slapstick-loaded comedy also features a very likable villain, El Guapo, played by Alfonso Aru. He's more than famous. They are funny guys. He's infamous. Sillier than any of the other comedies on this list, Three Amigos is pure, mindless, hysterical entertainment. I will watch anything with Martin Short. It was on this film that Short and Steve Martin first met. Kismet, actually. The screenplay was written by Steve Martin, Lorne Michaels, and singer-songwriter Randy Newman, who also wrote My Little Buttercup and The Ballad of the Three Amigos. The score was by Elmer Bernstein, whose previous soundtracks include The Ten Commandments and The Magnificent Seven. Bernstein had also scored National Lampoon's Animal House for Landis, a kid in the neighborhood. Go see it. I'll come back one day. Why? Number six, Rustler's Rhapsody, is a loving spoof of singing cowboys and B-Westerns. How was it? Oh, it was nice. It was, uh... Since it was made in 1985, and it's from Police Academy writer-director Hugh Wilson, we know it will be wild and filled with loving tributes to every white-hatted Western hero and cowboy cliché Wilson could think of. 
Rustler's Rhapsody begins with a black-and-white montage of B-Westerns and a narrator wondering what a singing cowboy movie would be like to a modern audience. It stars Tom Berenger getting plenty of laughs playing it straight as singing hero Rex. You want to be a sidekick, you got to learn the ropes. With trusty sidekick G.W. Bailey, who narrates. Good, very good. Thank you very much. And a cast that includes Andy Griffith and Fernando Ray as villains, Celia Ward is the rancher's daughter, and even a rival good guy, Patrick Wayne, whose motives Andy are questionable. Standing in the saddle. Standing in the saddle. It's especially fun to see Griffith break loose from his squeaky clean Andy of Mayberry image and embrace the comedic possibilities of a cattle baron with hidden secrets. The soundtrack by Stephen Dorff is terrific especially the memorable closing credits tune sung by Rex Allen Jr. You've all heard it many times. It's the last of the Silver Screen Cowboys and is the most fitting conclusion to this very funny family comedy that should have been more successful, but wasn't. Number 5, 1948's The Pale Face, paired wisecracking coward Bob Hope with the outlaw's Jane Russell. It was magic. Hope's floundering dental school graduate, painless Peter Potter, a coward, of course, and Russell's double-barreled Calamity Jane were perfectly cast, and their on-screen chemistry exudes both laughs and sexiness. Released from prison to track down a gang selling rifles to the Indians, Jane goes undercover and hooks up with Painless as her clueless husband. Jane's sharpshooting skills are mistaken for Hope's, and he becomes a local hero. Naturally, Hope is convinced that he is the top man, although he's much more adept at laughing gas. Bob's amorous advances and rejections are funny, and so are all the Western cliches that still, after all these years, continue to entertain audiences. Hope's patented one-liners and great quips complement the slapstick, and the pacing never lags. Even the musical interlude, Buttons and Bows, sung by Hope, is entertaining and resulted in an Academy Award for Best Song, and later a hit record for Dinah Shore. This popular comedy was one of the top grossing films of the year. It was co-written by cartoon comedy gag writer, director, and future feature film director Frank Tashlin, who later mentored Jerry Lewis in the art of directing slapstick comedy. Tashlin also wrote and directed the hit sequel, Son of Pale Face, in 1952, with Hope and Russell reprising their roles, joined by the king of the cowboys, Roy Rogers and Trigger, who ends up in bed with Hope's Junior Potter. Number four, support your local sheriff. As TV's charming, reticent Western hero, James Garner's Brett Maverick had no equal. In director Burt Kennedy's superb Western send-off, Support Your Local Sheriff in 1969, Garner brought that same wonderful personality to the big screen. The perfectly cast Garner is a stranger just passing through town on his way to Australia who gets roped into becoming only temporarily the town's sheriff. He suck his finger in the end of your what? Kennedy wasn't just your ordinary comedy director, but one with superb Western movie credentials. As a writer, he'd worked with director Bud Bedecker on a series of acclaimed Randolph Scott classics, before directing several successful films of his own, including The War Wagon. That background allowed Kennedy to not only spoof the genre, but honor it with a rich cast of veterans. Just hold it! In a salute to the villainous role in My Darling Clementine, three-time Academy Award winner Walter Brennan became Pa Danby, the head of dim-witted sons, the most inept being Bruce Dern. Okay, go ahead! Others include Harry Morgan, Gene Evans, and the irreplaceable Joan Hackett as Garner's klutzy love interest. Then she was always kind of big for her age, and poverty hit her hard. That'll do it, you know. The biggest casting surprise almost didn't happen. 
Kennedy had to fight hard to cast card-playing buddy and glass-eyed villain Jack Elam as Deputy Jake, who almost steals the film in a career-changing performance. Written by William Bauer, Support Your Local Sheriff was one of the very best films, not just comedies, of a very competitive year for Westerns. Number three in our list of the top ten comedy Westerns is Cat Ballou. Before portraying dual gunfighters in Elliot Silverstein's 1965 classic Cat Ballou, Lee Marvin had made a career as one of the screen's most intimidating villains. Following the critical and public success of Cat Ballou, Marvin became a leading man. Arriving toward the end of the Western film and TV boom, the genre was ripe for satire. Marvin's dual role as gunfighting brothers, Tim Strom, the evil one missing a nose that was bitten off in a gunfight, and Kid Shalene, who has a very serious drinking problem, is what makes the film memorable. Jane Fonda's comely Catherine Ballou's father was killed by Strawn, and she hires Kid Shalene to bring him down. After having been drunk for 20 years, the kid shows up and the number of laughs multiply faster than a pile of empty whiskey bottles. He's old, inept, and drunk. So, Fonda decides to trap guns onto her tight-fitting jeans and go after the killer with a gang of her own. Besides Fonda in her first hit movie, the cast includes Dwayne Hickman, Michael Callan, and the indispensable Tom Nardini as members of her gang. Okay, you open up. Nope. Now come on now, open it. What's wrong? He won't open safe, says he'd rather die. Is that right, mister? Yeah. Seven left, 26 right, 14 left. And acting as sort of a musical Greek chorus is the wonderful duo Stubby K and Nat King Cole who sadly died before the film was released. Not all the comedy holds up today, but Kid Shalene singing Happy Birthday at a funeral and the song The Ballad of Cat Ballou by Mac David and Jerry Livingston are unforgettable. When Marvin picked up his Academy Award for Best Actor in this film, he said half the credit should go to his horse. Coming in at a close number two in our list of the top ten comedy westerns is McClintock, the 1963 John Wayne Marino O'Hara comedy love fest. This western can be enjoyed by both young and old, and it is. Even those who don't like westerns love this broad, old-fashioned comedy romance. For kids who don't know about John Wayne... It's the perfect introduction. Duke is George Washington McClintock and is attempting to help Native Americans while his estranged wife, Maureen, of course, is trying for a divorce and custody of their teenage daughter. Patrick Wayne co-stars vying with his out-of-his-element Easterner, Jerry Van Dyke, for the hand of the McClintock's daughter, lovely newcomer Stephanie Powers. Directed by Andrew V. McLaughlin and produced by Duke's son, Michael, the cast is filled with familiar faces, veterans from Wayne and John Ford films. Besides the two leads and youngsters, there's Chill Wills, Bruce Cabot, Yvonne DiCarlo, Hank Worden, Ed Faulkner, Robert Lowry, Bob Steele, Michael Pate, Leo Gordon, Struther Martin, Chuck Roberson, and the great Hal Needham. This Western comedy has something for everyone. McClintock is a love story with fisticuffs. We'll all calm down. Oh, she's just a little excited. I know, I know. Slapstick, father-daughter discussions, spankings, and most memorably, mudslides. And somebody ought to belt you in the mouth. But I won't. I won't. The hell I won't. For the finale, there's a gag-filled comical chase through the streets during a 4th of July celebration. The fun never stops. Stuntman and Olympic gold medalist Dean Smith doubled O'Hara for the latter gag and running through the streets in pantaloons and wearing a wig. But Marine, and it seems everyone else, did their own slide down that very steep and slippery hillside. 
One thing that I always get a kick out of, most of you probably have missed. You know that scene when Stephanie asked Duke to shoot Patrick? Yep. Well, did you ever notice that Patrick doesn't have a hat in his hand when Duke points the gun? When he fires, there's a hat in Pat's hand. That kind of thing usually bothers me. But in this wild comedy, it just makes me laugh. Number one on our top ten list has often been called the funniest Western film of all time. Very few disagree. Blasting its way to the top of the list is... Blazing Saddles. It's Mel Brooks' hysterical 1972 compilation of every Western cliché imaginable, and some that aren't. Francis. When a film opens with a song about a hero riding on a blazing saddle and sung by the king of Western movie themes, balladeer Frankie Lane, belting out this fire burner of a title, you need to cinch up or get bucked off for the riotous ride ahead. Hoping to destroy the town of Rock Ridge so that the citizens will sell their land cheap, the corrupt town boss, Headley Lamar, Harvey Corman, appoints a black sheriff, Cleavon Little's Black Bart. The sheriff buddies up with former Top Gun, the Waco kid, Gene Wilder, now a forlorn and wasted alcoholic. It's a breakout role for Wilder, whose sad sack lovable quality is unique. What's your name? Well, my name is Tim, but most people call me Jim. In her Oscar-nominated role, Madeline Kahn lampoons Marlena Dietrich's singer-hostess as Lily von Stupp. Is that a ten-gallon hat, or are you just enjoying the show? Director Brooks plays several parts in the film, from a cross-eyed mayor to a Jewish Indian, and makes the most of each. Work, 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 work. Ow! Oh! Ow! Have you ever seen such cruelty? Other zanies in this irreverent, brilliant film include Dom DeLuise, David Huddleston, John Hillerman, and George Furse. It's a town full of Johnsons. In fact, the cast was so loaded with comedians that every take was ruined due to off-camera laughter. After about starting into the second week, you know, we had every take, you know, a lot of, you'll do 10, 12 takes sometimes. Somebody was laughing through the first seven or eight or nine takes and starting in the second week. Mel came in and said, listen, what we're going to do now is we're going to laugh all we want to on the first two times. The first, he said, after the first two times, nobody is to laugh. Originally, Black Bart was to be played by co-writer Richard Pryor, but at that time, studios were afraid to risk money on such a controversial performer. When the film was released, most critics slammed the movie for being overly crude and tasteless. Actually, those are some of the qualities that helped make it a hit. And every effort of the filmmaker seems to be made to avoid good taste. Surprisingly, up until Dances with Wolves replaced it in 1986, Blazing Saddles was the highest grossing Western of all time. It certainly would be difficult, if not impossible, to produce a film as outrageous, irreverent, and at times as disgusting as Blazing Saddles in today's PC environment. But why would we want to? We'll always have Mel Brooks and his posse at their best in the funniest Western comedy ever made. Number one, Blazing Saddles. And of course, you can tune in every week because every Sunday morning we post a new episode. Next time, we'll probably have one of the interviews on. And luckily, we do have those stockpiled. But let us know that you're watching, comment. And when you uh, ring that bell, it'll let you be notified of our next episode. Don't miss a one. Thank you again for watching. And let's keep the Western alive. Let's keep our hands clean so that those Fanner 50s don't get all dirty and German-fested, okay? See you next time.